The year is 2001. WWE are about to put on WrestleMania 17. This WrestleMania will go on to be considered as one of the greatest of all time. It's going to have so many great matches like Undertaker vs Triple H, Shane McMahon vs Vince McMahon, and what is widely considered to be the greatest WrestleMania main event ever between Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock is also going to happen. There are almost 70,000 fans in attendance in the Texas Astrodome, and over 1 million people have bought the WrestleMania pay-per-view and are eagerly waiting in anticipation. WrestleMania 17 starts and the crowd is on fire. Paul Heyman and Jim Ross are doing commentary for the night and are hyping up the show. Then suddenly, a loud bang is heard and feed cuts out for a few minutes. Viewers at home are confused and pissed off. The feed returns with a message from a barely put together Jim Ross, who explains with tears in his eyes that his broadcast partner, Paul Heyman, has just been shot by ECW wrestler Tommy Dreamer. And Tommy Dreamer has also just shot himself, and that WrestleMania cannot go on. He apologizes and tells fans that they will get a refund. Fans in the arena are in a hysteria as to what they just witnessed and go home in tears. Fans at home think it's an angle at first, but word slowly spreads that what happened wasn't a work. It was as real as can get. Worldwide news reports on the incident and it's all the world is talking about. Every WrestleMania from then on out has a sour taste and will never be the same. The very next night after the incident on WWE Raw, Vince McMahon explains what happened and the bell tolls 10 times. This episode is a tribute to Paul Heyman minus Tommy Dreamer and features all the WrestleMania 17 matches that fans didn't get to see. Steve Austin doesn't turn heel as planned by aligning himself with Vince McMahon and instead stays a babyface in order for fans to have some optimism about the product. After this, WWE officially blacklists ECW and anything to do with the company is given the Chris Benoit treatment. The invasion angle is cancelled and ECW alumni already in WWE are made into jobbers. No one else from ECW is signed in WWE, and one of WWE's greatest pay-per-views, ECW's One Night Stand, never happens. Rob Van Dam never becomes WWE Champion. Brock Lesnar debuts and he doesn't have a manager and he just becomes another big boring guy and doesn't go far in WWE. CM Punk has to find another way besides ECW to make his name in WWE. No one in power backs him or likes his attitude and no one is advocating hard for him backstage. CM Punk doesn't go very far in WWE. Current day Roman Reigns doesn't have a manager in his corner that makes his tribal chief character more compelling and he's left to do it all himself. Fans aren't convinced so they turn on him again. This is only the tip of the iceberg because there's so many more examples, but this is how the wrestling industry could have turned out if Tommy Dreamer actually executed his plan to murder Paul Heyman and then himself at WrestleMania 17 in 2001. Tommy Dreamer revealed on his House of Hardcore podcast in 2019 that he was seriously contemplating this plan, but he ultimately chose not to go through with this plan. But why did Tommy Dreamer have so much hate in his heart for Paul Heyman that he wanted to murder him on the biggest stage of them all in front of almost 70,000 people? Why was he so depressed that he wanted to end his own life after he committed this heinous act? And why didn't he go through with this evil plan that would have put a black stain on the wrestling industry? Paul Heyman and Tommy Dreamer go way back. In the early 90s, Dreamer was wrestling on the independent circuit and was the pretty boy Tommy Dreamer, who was a teenage heartthrob that wore suspenders. At this time, Dreamer and Taz were best friends and wrestled matches across the independent circuit. ECW had just recently rebranded from Eastern Championship Wrestling to Extreme Championship Wrestling. The owner of this promotion, Paul Heyman, needed some names to help build up the company, and he was initially interested in Taz, but seeing that Dreamer and Taz constantly worked together, he invited both of them to wrestle in ECW. They did so, and of course they knocked it out of the park. Three days after this match, Paul Heyman called Tommy Dreamer to meet up with him to show him the film of the match that he had with Taz. He showed him that after the match was over, there were four fans in the crowd that gave Dreamer a standing ovation as he went to the back. And in that moment, he told Dreamer that because those four people really believed in him, at this moment, ECW was filled with bad guy types and Paul Heyman was desperate to have a true babyface in the company, and he decided to push Dreamer as that babyface. Dreamer initially continued with his pretty boy gimmick, but this gimmick wasn't resonating with the fans. All of this changed in his feud with the Sandman. Often an American citizen was arrested in Singapore and sentenced to a caning. Yes, a literal caning. Paul Heyman decided to capitalize on the publicity by booking a Singapore cane match between Dreamer and the Sandman, in which the loser would have to take 10 lashes from a bamboo cane. This wasn't some work bamboo cane too. 
was a cane of the same standard that they use in Singapore for canings. Tommy Dreamer lost his match and being the babyface, he had to take 10 lashes. These lashes were so brutal that Dreamer's back even started bleeding. Fans in the crowd were telling Dreamer to just quit and some were even crying. But Tommy didn't give in and took the lashes like a champ. This was such a powerful moment and caused fans to really rally behind Dreamer. Kind of our fans rallied behind Cody Rhodes when MJF whipped him with a belt in the early days of AEW. From this moment on, Dreamer's babyface momentum was rolling and he was over with the fans. What got him even more over was his feud with Raven that lasted two years. These two were portrayed as childhood friends who had been competing in different ways their entire lives. In the two years of the feud, Dreamer had awesome matches with Raven even though he never got a win until their very last match. This feud really helped to put Dreamer on the map in the wrestling world. During all of these years, Dreamer got closer and closer to Heyman. Heyman saw Dreamer as his project and he would often congratulate him after matches and tell him how valuable he was to ECW. Paul Heyman also really helped him to get over as he was a major mentor to Tommy and a sort of a bigger brother to him. The two men had so much trust for one another that Tommy's fingerprints inevitably got all over ECW. Dreamer eventually became the number two guy backstage in ECW behind Paul Heyman. If this was WWE, I was talent relations. I was merchandise and I was creative with Paul. Tommy Dreamer was doing a whole lot in ECW and he even became a writer and booker for the show. He even booked and ran a few shows. That's how much Paul Heyman trusted him and how close their relationship was. Together they put ECW on the map. ECW was known for pushing boundaries with its violent wrestling, absurdly dramatic storylines, scantily clad women, and promos that blurred the lines between fiction and reality. It was a company that was built on taking things too far. ECW was kind of like a traveling freak show and the fans had a cult-like devotion to the brand. ECW was undoubtedly one of the most influential companies in wrestling history as WCW and WWE often stole from them and ECW is even credited for inspiring the Attitude Era within WWE. ECW perfectly encapsulated the mid to late 90s grunge era but just in a wrestling format and the genius behind this was mainly Paul Heyman but with a lot of help from Tommy Dreamer. But Paul was hiding something very big from Tommy Dreamer. He was secretly in cahoots with WWE's Vince McMahon since the early days of ECW. On the surface, ECW was doing well, but they were actually very strapped for cash. And this is where Vincent Kennedy McMahon came in. McMahon lent a helping hand to ECW by giving them and Paul Heyman money in exchange for ECW being a feeder system to WWE. Through this feeder system, they were able to get their hands on stars like Stone Cold Steve Austin, Mick Foley, the Dudley Boys, Taz and more. McMahon had this secret relationship with Paul Heyman to have an edge over their biggest rival, WCW. Even though WCW got some ECW guys, Vince McMahon had inside info on them and he had first preference on them. And this was all through Paul Heyman. Vince treated ECW as his investment and aided Heyman so that he could groom talent for cherry picking later on. This working relationship with WWE really helped ECW because they were on the cusp of a collapse as early as 1996, but Vincent Kennedy McMahon provided much needed funds to Paul Heyman to save ECW. According to people in the business like Jim Ross and more, McMahon gave Paul Heyman $500,000 in 1996 in order to save ECW and on top of this he was personally cutting checks to Paul Heyman every single month for $50,000. Tommy Dreamer was aware of none of this when it was going on. With all this money, Heyman was able to keep ECW going and through this working relationship, he was also able to get ECW wrestlers on WWE TV like through the invasion angles of WWE Raw by ECW wrestlers in 1997. The storyline continued for a couple of months and ECW stars gained exposure on national television like Tommy Dreamer and a few WWE wrestlers were sent to ECW for training and development. But despite all of Vince McMahon's help to ECW and Paul Heyman, ECW was still suffering financially. A lot of this was due to Paul Heyman's notoriously bad handling of money. New Jack even stated that during this period, Paul Heyman would spend tens of thousands of dollars at casinos instead of paying his wrestlers money. Paul Heyman had a bad reputation for not paying his wrestlers for weeks and sometimes even months. He was known for lying to wrestlers and screwing them over. This led to wrestlers having no problem with moving on from ECW and moving on to greener pastures. This created a massive problem for ECW because they were constantly having to create new stars which was hard to do. One of the wrestlers who was offered a lot of money to leave was Tommy Dreamer. He was offered a multi-year $750,000 contract to join WCW. He told Paul Heyman this and Paul started to cry and begged him to stay in ECW. He told Dreamer that if he leaves ECW, the company will go out of business and all of his friends will be out of jobs. Because Dreamer trusted Heyman so much, he decided to stay in ECW and reject the life-changing $750,000 contract from WCW. 
ECW was suffering financially so much so that Dreamer even used some of his own money and his parents' money to keep the company afloat. Tommy loved ECW and trusted Paul Heyman so much that he was willing to do anything to make things work. But unfortunately, it was not enough. And by 2001, ECW had used up all of its lives and was shut down for good. And later on, its library and likeness was acquired by WWE. This absolutely crushed Tommy Dreamer and sent him into a deep depression. He loved ECW so much and he was the heart and soul of the company, but now it was gone. He was now a broke man in his 30s who had to move back into his parents' house, which was soul crushing. It was during this time that Dreamer's hate for Heyman really started to brew. And this was for a couple of reasons. One reason is that Heyman gave up on ECW well before it went under and didn't make actions to revive it when he could have. Before ECW folded, he was supposed to look for a new network to broadcast ECW even though Paul Heyman went to LA to supposedly do this, it's been speculated that Heyman was not actually looking for broadcasters in Hollywood, but instead was looking for acting opportunities. What also irked Dreamer was the fact that even before ECW officially closed, Heyman had already signed for WWE and was working on a commentator. But what really got Dreamer's blood boiling was when he found out that Heyman was secretly getting paid by WWE and he told him to reject that life-changing $750,000 contract from WCW. Dreamer felt betrayed by Heyman and he felt that all of the loyalty that he showed toward him was for nothing because he was now destitute, depressed and dependent on his parents when he could have been living the high life on that WCW money. And this was all because someone he trusted so much had lied to him. Real hatred was in his heart for Heyman at this point. Finally some good news came though and Heyman had called Dreamer and told him that he was able to get him signed to WWE and he was set to debut in the famous TLC2 match at WrestleMania 17. Dreamer was supposed to take Rhino's spot as the interference on behalf of Edge and Christian in this match. However, these plans changed to Dreamer being involved in a hardcore championship match at WrestleMania 17. Since Dreamer was in a bad place, all of this left him optimistic for the future. But alas, he was told that neither of these things would be happening and he would not be involved at WrestleMania 17. This was truly the last straw for him. Along with his smothering depression, his intense hatred for Heyman solidified because he felt that Heyman wasn't trying hard enough to get him a job in WWE. He felt hopeless. And around the week of WrestleMania 17, Dreamer had noticed a sign that said, Guns are welcome for WrestleMania. He was confused but was told that guns were allowed inside Texas venues. With this knowledge, along with the terrible mental health that he was suffering from, led him to legitimately thinking about going to WrestleMania with a gun and shooting Paul Heyman and then himself. It was on his mind for days. He had the whole thing planned out too. He would have jumped the rail right behind where Heyman would have been sitting on commentary and shot him in the back of the head, did his classic pose and then shot himself too. He was in an absolutely awful mind state to concoct this evil plan, but fortunately, help from an unlikely source came. With Dreamer in a dark place mentally, he got a phone call from someone that he didn't know, so he ignored it. It was Jim Ross and he left a message for Dreamer and he told him to hang tight because they were still thinking of him and that they were going to get it done and he was going to be in WWE soon. This phone call got Dreamer out of the depressive state that he was in and it gave him some hope for the future and he decided not to go through with his plan. Luckily for Dreamer, he was brought into the company not long after WrestleMania and even though he was never positioned as a top star, he still enjoyed a successful career in WWE. The wrestling landscape would have been totally different if Dreamer had gone through with his plans, but thankfully fate stopped him from doing so. This whole situation just puts into perspective how much you don't know what the next person is going through. If you know anyone suffering from depression or mental illness, reach out to them because you could be saving lives by doing so. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos and also please like, share, comment and subscribe. But anyway, goodbye.